Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place Podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and super excited to have with me today Jim Ellis and Dr. Sarah Gilman. And I'm going to do um, read their a little bit of their bios and just to kind of give you a feel for who they are and what they're doing, and then we'll, we'll jump into some introductions. So Jim Ellis is an award-winning playwright and reporter who now owns Legacy Productions, a local production company that in 2012 produced an the acclaimed Indoctrinated, The Grooming of Our Children into Prostitution. An author of eight books and producer of 100 video presentations, Jim is now working on a new educational film, Keeping the Peace, which he is here to talk about today, uh, supporting law enforcement officers in their mental and emotional wellness. Dr. Sarah Gilman is a licensed marriage and family therapist, has a doctorate degree in psychology with a certification in sports psychology. In 2017, her doctoral dissertation focused on the effects of cumulative traumatic stress exposure in first responders and the use of EMDR as an early intervention. For the past 32 years, she has specialized in the areas of traumatic stress, addictions, and peak performance, which all of that, I'm like, that is so cool. (laughs) I did EMDR. I love it. I love the work both of you are doing. So welcome, Jim and Dr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to have you here. So, yeah, so Jim, talk to us about this project, Keeping the Peace. Well, it's interesting. We were talking earlier about um, our own healing path and uh, our own path to wellness and our, you know, mental and emotional. So uh, I've had my own pathway there um, throughout the years. And at some point, I picked up a camera. And at some point, I picked up the ability to edit. And I realized I could use this ability to create documentaries or educational films that would also help bring wellness and peace and healing to others. And um, to make a long story short, I was at a indoctrinated, um, my film indoctrinated was being screened at a forum and a police officer came up to me afterwards and said, you know what? I need to make sure that this film is seen by all the police officers in the county for the uh, human trafficking task force and i went i love that idea you go do that that would be great right right later that later that day i'm like you know what i haven't done a documentary or a film in a while what else could i do what else could i do and the very next day i had a lunch with a friend of mine who was an ex-police officer and he says you know what jim you know what's really needed out there is a film or support of officers in there wellness because of the stats of PTSD, the stress on the job and the effects that, you know, that has on, on them. They need help. I said, okay. So I just started on this journey. It's a long one. Six months of being ignored by chiefs all over the county is all part of the process, you know, as you uh, like hold the line and like go for your dreams. And then uh, found a, an in here and there and to different officers. And uh, lo and behold, by this time, I had met Dr. Sarah awesome incredible woman who's doing incredible work she's been supportive i have 30 other contacts that have been helpful and including all the chiefs of police in the san diego county behind this and uh, are supporting it as well so there's more to it but um, basically the idea is keeping the peace show have a film that's available for officers for the chiefs as they want to use it it's up you know right. their discretion is going to be a gift to them in may of 2019 all throughout the state all throughout the country a gift that these uh, departments can use to really inspire officers to know that uh, you know uh, what they face is is uh, well what they face is not natural you know maybe not natural to the common person but their responses to it are natural and that they do have support they can get support and it is available to for their own wellness for themselves, their family, and those they serve. Right, and not just direct trauma, but secondary trauma, which is a big part of um, what they experience. And Dr. Sarah, you can probably address that as well. Yeah, you know, you don't have, it doesn't have to be your emergency to experience some of the impact. We, one of the things that I looked into in my doctoral process was the impact of the cumulative, the pileup, the year after year after year of being chronically exposed to really human tragedy. Um, Now they have training and so at least they have the experience in being able to do something. 
you know, the rest of us would run away from some of these critical incidences because we don't have any training or skills or we need to keep ourselves safe first. Um, but it's the cumulative stress. It's not necessarily one incident, although, you know, that could be a, a tipping point. Um, but it's really about what's happening uh, year after year, decade after decade. And, you know, the mortality rate for police officers, correction officers, is uh, following retirement is like 18 months to five years. Uh, and, you know, these folks retire early, early per se, because right. they have to, you know, in their 50s. And I don't know about you, but I'm past my 50s and I've got a lot of life left. Right. <laughs> so we, won't, we won't go into age anyway, but, you know. Uh, so it's really tragic that uh, that's the life expectancy because they've given so much of their life force, if you will, um, and it's been drained from them for these decades of service. Right. And th but this film is to talk about the hope aspect of it and what right. can be done um, that they can do. So what 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 is the process of with this film and what what exactly like kind of walk us through what you're doing with it and your hopes with it? Okay. So so far, what I've done is. Um, well, I've done all, I have like, I have enough footage right now with all the different interviews, 30 plus, to create a mini series. I mean, I have so <laughs> much footage. So, but what I want to hone it down to Be is... Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I know. Well, that, that's, yeah, that's coming. Uh, I'm going to hone it down to 30 minutes for one, one of the pieces. Um, the overall educational film, uh, Keeping the Peace, will be 30 minutes. And what it's going to do is going to be inspirational. So it's going to, it's going to be inspirational that it'll give the officers hope. Uh, one of the ways you give anyone hope is to actually have a reflection back to themselves, a reflection of what they've gone through. It's a way of giving empathy and compassion, which actually reaches people if you can give a reflection of them. So they'll be watching a, a, a film where they'll be seeing different officers and e including different chiefs talk about what they have seen, what they have gone through. And the key point about the, the film, besides showing you know, what officers have gone through, giving them empathy and compassion on a certain level, it will also you know, itemize the different ways that they can get support. And the big point, and this, I really think this is the big point of the, of the film, besides the fact that it will open up hearts and minds on this topic, is that we have police chiefs giving the green light. Okay, so one of the concerns I know and what I've heard is that uh, officers would not want to uh, speak to mental and emotional wellness because of fear of their job security, getting their badge taken away, uh, or appearing weak, or whatever have you with this stigma. And I think maybe Dr. Sarah can talk about that as well. But um, when you have police chiefs saying that they do get support and that they really want their officers to get the support that they need, to me, it's going to be a big green light that will at least, at the very least, bring up a conversation that is very vital uh, where the final result is um, permission granted, permission desired, and uh, officers knowing that they can take that path. Yes, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. We uh, sadly had an officer that killed himself in a park in Cincinnati recently. Um, and, and just so heartbreaking because... Um, you know, and I know the impact that it probably had on all of the officers in the city, um, you know, whether they worked with this individual or not. And just, just, I mean, just heartbreaking, I mean, for everyone involved. Um, and so if you can do something that will, yes, address this and prevent this and, and help officers, absolutely. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so he had asked you to maybe address... Um, address this, Dr. Sarah? The stigma. Well, I wanted to just kind of say when I met Jim, it was at the uh, sort of uh, sort of the beginning of this project. And um, I was so excited. Now, that was a while ago now. Uh, and I'm still really excited. But here's the reason. The potential for this in the departments across the nation, uh, the message and seeing their own peers, and like you said, the chiefs who have started where they started, uh, reflecting back on their own careers uh, and the permission um, that the potential here for breaking through the stigma and creating a common language and talking about one thing that you and I are passionate about Terry is our EMDR yeah. um, you know Jim's a civilian Jim's outside of mental health 
and he was starting to, uh, he caught the, the passion very quickly. Um, I go in and my team goes in to police departments all over our county at briefings when the shift change so we can catch everybody and we get like 15 minutes to, to check in, talk about mental health, resilience, post-traumatic stress, what to do, and reach out. But we're just beings, you know, we can only do that so mm -hmm. often, you know, but the potential of a film to be in the library of every police department in the country I was I was relieved because uh, maybe that means I can retire one day <laughs> um, but I think the message is so clear and I also watched Jim's sort of evolution of when he got to interview somebody and the story that he heard and you know I get a text like oh my gosh and I was saying sending emails out to chiefs that I personally knew. And uh, Jim remembers this because I, I let him know that I was doing this or I asked permission. I said, hey, this guy's legit. <laughs> uh, I, in other words, open your door. Please talk to him. Let him in. Right. This, this project, because you, you all know that you're either in the door at the department or you're not. There's no in between. Um, and so I felt strong enough uh, and passionate enough about what he was doing that I was willing to say, please open your door. This is for sure. And, um, you know, here we are at the tail end. It's, it's really exciting. Right. So, Jim, did you, were you aware of EMDR and its uses um, before meeting with Dr. Sarah? Or was this a new, something new that you brought into the film? Yeah, when doing my research, I did come across the term EMDR, but I did not know exactly what it was. I, uh, you know, I just knew it had a certain good good results. And what was awesome is that uh, Dr. Sarah, uh, when I did do the interview with her, I think it was maybe her idea. It's like, why don't we actually do a session, um, or somebody could be doing a session, and I could film that. Uh, because what can that, that can do is that could really give a clear idea for somebody who's watching yeah. what, it, what it looks like, what, uh, cause you, you can explain it like with a few words, but when you see it, it can, I think really help the mind of the observer to know, okay, I would be sitting there. This is what it would look like. And then in the interview process, we hear, you know, what the results are and, uh, Dr. Sarah uh, described the process. So I'd not heard about it before. I'd done my own kind of regression work and different modalities that I've used in my life, but I'd not heard of this, but I've heard great results. And uh, luckily, we now have great footage of it. And uh, besides the 30 minute uh, version of uh, keeping the peace, I'm gonna have short, shorter vignettes that could be used on YouTube and things like that. And one of them is definitely about EMDR and the work that Dr. Sarah does. Wonderful. Well, that's, that's amazing. And yes, EMDR was certainly life altering for me. Um, you know, it took four years and 98 sessions, uh, but we had a very tangled, <laughs> a tangled ball of trauma history with me from age four to 22 with just a, a lot of stuff to go through. And we, we, we had to keep going back into it, but I, I truly, I tell everyone, you know, it was certainly life altering for me. Um, you know, it's amazing too that EMDR International Association has a particular directory of EMDR therapists around the country that if you go on there, it's flagged of whether they have competency to uh, cultural competency in working with first responders. And I just got a text the other day from someone, a lieutenant I know uh, in a department that's at, back at the FBI Academy. And uh, she sent me a picture of the presenter's PowerPoint and it said EMDR in law enforcement. And that's at the FBI Academy. Now, 25 years ago, I was a firefighter and a mental health professional and trying to even say the word CISM, critical incident, how about coming in for a debrief? I mean, you know, it was a tough road to get where we are. Um, and so I think Jim's film, it's, it's so ripe right now. Uh, it will not be dismissed. It will be absorbed, which is really fantastic. I think that's fantastic too. Absolutely. Oh. I was wondering um, for our, for the audience, um, I don't know about your audience, if they know what EMDR, but can, can one of you, or maybe Dr. Sarah, talk about what that exactly is? Or? Go ahead, Dr. Sarah, yes. That's okay. Okay, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. 
It's uh, pro probably about 30 years old now. It is not brand new. It's not woo woo, uh, <laughs> but it was. I mean, I was trained in 94. And it was like, what are we doing? This eye movement thing and, and the therapist has to like be quiet. That was not in my training. <laughs> quiet and go like this, you know, right. uh, back and forth. And so it certainly has evolved as has neuroscience. And in, a, in its very simplest form, why we think it works to sort of re-digest uh, experiences and memories. You know, I say it's holographic sight, sound, smells. That's how we hold them in our systems, in our supercomputer. Some information is filed, most of it's filed really well in our supercomputer and um, some gets disrupted in the filing and gets stuck and begins to produce hiccups in the nervous system, flashbacks, you know, all those kinds of things. So EMDR, somewhat replicates what our hard drive already has and that's the system of REM sleep. So it's activating the whole brain and the nervous system to file the data in an efficient place. When it's inefficiently filed, we have uh, symptoms. Panic so, attacks. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, and it, it's the pileup. And so yeah. um, EMDR is in the top three evidence-based treatments for PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, but what we are seeing now in some of the recent research is that EMDR early intervention, which is some slightly different protocols, if done sooner than later, we could potentially prevent the pileup, help the system file all this exposure ah. that these moms are having while, you know, in a short order. And, and fingers crossed, we're starting to do some research about early intervention EMDR to potentially inoculate against PTSD. Um, so that is very exciting. That is and, exciting, and, yes. And it's not just with law enforcement. Um, the other thing is Jim's film reflects the stories from uh, officers. The reason so many uh, first responders are coming in for EMDR is because their peers have told them like, wow, I don't know what the heck that was. And they use different language than that. Which right. on the podcast. Because it's culturally accepted there, but not here. Right, right. And, you know, in, you know they don't want to see mental health. That has a bad connotation. Um, but when they have easy access to mental health that understands, um, and then this kind of exposure where they've already heard about it, uh, they come in. And um, that's pretty exciting. And it works. Yes. It, it reboots the system. I like to tell them, you know, it's sort of like your system is buffering. You're not as efficient. Now, here's the problem in law enforcement, that when the system's not running efficiently, it's buffering. It affects decision making. And officers have to make decisions in a split second. And um, if they're hesitant in any way, that could be a life-threatening experience for themselves or somebody around them. Right. So they do want to reboot. They want it. They're optimal. They want to be at their best. Excellent. All right. So any myths or facts that you want to clarify that you've kind of learned along the way, Jim, in this, in this process? Yeah, well, the, the biggest myth that I... Uh, 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 I don't know, revealed, I guess, is that policemen are not human. <laughs> it's something that actually happens, I believe, in our culture is that um, it's an us and them mentality that uh, like Robocop or these, these people are just like, they're so stoic and, you know, maybe they, you know, in, this, in the situations that you find yourself in dealing with police, maybe it looks like they don't care. You know, they're just doing their job and maybe they're making money for the government. Ah, there's all these myths about what's going on out there. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. When I, before I started this, I had my own biases uh, about police officers, even though I'd worked with them on my previous documentary. So I knew there was like great people out there, but the still in the back of my head was like, you know what? They're not human. Okay. So what happens is you just go one little layer below that surface and you find what I have found is the biggest hearts, the most caring, the most service, the, the, the people so willing, male and female, to sacrifice so much for the good. Because they, you know, deep, you know, to go through so much of what they've gone through and to remain in a job like that, there's got to be some motivation in there that is uh, beyond comprehension, really. Yeah. And right. so, 
So the myth and uh, the story I always like to tell is, you know, before I did this project or started working on it, if I'm driving and I look in the rear view mirror and I see a policeman back there, I'm like starting to sweat. I'm getting a little nervous. Like what's happening? <laughs> right. swear, to, swear to goodness. I had this experience after starting to work with them and knowing that, oh, these are just people too. And they're doing their best. And so a lot of them are doing incredible works. Now I drive, I look in the rear view mirror and my thought is, oh, good. Oh, good. They're around, they're here, they're serving. So my biggest vision for, one of the biggest visions for this project is, uh, yes, wellness for the officers, and, but also a shift of the culture to realize they're accepting their humanity, their humanness. We see them the same way. We build a community that was good for, uh, for uh, one unified force for the good of all communities. So that's like the, you know, the huge vision for my uh, for the project is that we shift a culture. We are one force for the good of all communities. Excellent. Dr. Let's Fierke. not leave out those uh, families of the first responders and the police officers. They too make an incredible commitment. Um, you know, they Jim's talked to them. I've worked with them for many decades. You know, when they leave uh, in the morning for work, they know every day that that may be the last. And most of us do not live like that, even though it, anything could happen to any of us, but they take that on and their families, um, the scheduling, the missed holidays, the exhaustion. Um, and so it's a big commitment. And your vision, Jim, is also could potentially support the families of law enforcement. Yeah, de yeah, definitely the families. In fact, one of the sections of the film I was looking at doing is having the families um, also speak to what they've experienced. And so that'll be another short vignette that uh, fits in there. In fact, I have one, one gentleman on the East Coast. His father was in the New York Police Department, NYPD, and he was part of a uh, kidnapping, I guess the Black Panthers, they kidnapped his, his dad for like a week. So he himself, the, my friend in New York, he went through his own trauma knowing that his dad's not home for a whole week. And when his dad returned, there was something that, you know, obviously the trauma was there. And so he's carried that. And now he has a vision to help me on the East Coast as well to get at the NYPD, Homeland Security. So we're all going to be helping each other out. And thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sarah, for mentioning the families. I love that. That's the, whole, I mean, I, I talked to you about a little bit before, Jim, you know, the, the vision of this podcast is to bring people together you know, to all help each other. And I say, you know, to shine the light of hope, but it's, you know, as we hold hands and that light just gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And I just, um, yeah, I love it that one, that you're getting the response you're getting um, in support of this and that it's going to, you know, that it is going to go out and, and reach who it needs to reach. So that's and I'll, and I'll Yeah. Thank you. And also what I'm thinking about it is there is so much media attention on those certain circumstances where uh, there's an officer involved shooting, maybe not all the facts are out there, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but there's this trend towards um, total, like, total negativity towards um, the police, right? So that has, I think, an accumulative effect as well on our minds as a society, but also mm -hmm. on the police officers who maybe feel even more us and them, like, you know, they are yeah. the threat, you know? So this is going to buck up against any agendas maybe that are out there to, uh, right. to paint all officers as, you know, violent and shooters and, you know, whatever, whatever that negativity right. is. We had um, just this last, in the last two weeks here in, I live just outside of Cincinnati in Claremont County and there was a sheriff that uh, was called to uh, an apartment where a gentleman was threatening suicide and two officers I think like did negotiations for 12 or 18 hours. So a very long amount of time. And he ended up shooting both officers and one was killed. But the outpouring of support from this community has been so incredible. And just, it, it was overwhelming. And from all over the country, you know, they did a procession for his funeral and it was miles upon miles upon miles long officers coming from Florida officers. I mean, they were just, it was incredible and how beautiful, you know, the connection was. Um, and that part was, that, that part was amazing to see how the community came in support of the officers. Yeah. yeah. 
And you know, Jim, I think your platform in terms of having it, it's media. And I, part of my advocacy is I've tried to hold some media folks accountable to what are, are they evenly um, representing first responders and law enforcement? Where are they really focusing? Um, and we know that most media, no matter what it is, is not presenting the whole picture. We see an angle of something, and then I have the honor and privilege sometimes to watch the body camera video of the other angle that happened, you know, which can't be released yet because of investigations and legal and all that. So the public is left with this uh, perception, and no doubt there are bad apples in every career. We know that. Right. Uh, one thing uh, in Austin, uh, Texas, in Austin Police Department, the police psychologist is in, in the midst of an incredible research project with um, using EMDR early um, because there's some data that suggests this cumulative subthreshold PTSD, okay, the post-traumatic stress injury that they all live, many of them live with, it, uh, is linked to excessive force. Okay, so that's a whole neuroscience and you know, but the, the goal is that if there's intervention early and the system gets to reset, that the pileup won't be creating this post-traumatic stress injury and we can watch excessive force uh, reduce. So that's really exciting. But your platform, Jim, with media is, is really important because it's the rest of the story. You know, it's the, the police officer who's a mother of an infant that had to go on call to CPR of an infant. And, um, it, you know, that's a mother. She's a mother first and a police officer second. And how does she go home that night and not have it impact her relationship? Or the detectives who are on these child abuse cases, and they they watch the the material, the the photos and the film over and over and over, and the data, and they go home to their elementary school age children. It it affects them, and right. so being able to help them make that transition sooner than later, um, and also for the public to be aware and the media to be aware is uh, they have to go home with all of this. Right. And that's that secondary trauma we were talking about, not necessarily a direct trauma, you know, an officer being shot at or, you know, being involved in an accident in a high speed chase. But it's that being exposed to, um, right. you know, yeah, coming upon an accident. You know, they weren't in the accident themselves, but they've been exposed to the and results I, of an accident. I just got an email today from the Association of uh, Experts in Traumatic Stress, which I'm, I'm a fellow in, but they said, um, confirmed 2019, today, there are 26 police suicides nationally. We're in February, wow. uh, two since last Saturday. And I'll throw this at us because I think Jim's film is gonna help us with this. You know, you just described, Terry, this beautiful processional and this honor of uh, the sacrifice. I believe that suicide is a line of duty death, but there is no processional. There is no honor. Mm. There's barely a funeral, a memorial, a celebration of life. Um, families don't know what to do. Oftentimes they feel like the law enforcement family also doesn't know what to do. So they get left behind or it's quiet, you know, and it's like, I just go, oh, we're missing something here. What a beautiful way to look at it. I mean, for such a horrifically sad situation, but yes, it, it is the cumul cumulative effects of the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Could I can I mention one of the, it reminds me of one of the interviews I did with a, one, a, a retired Department of Justice um, officer. I did an interview with him and he was talking about what happened 30 years ago, an incident 30 years ago. And I think this is, I've heard this is one of the hardest things to do uh, as far as trauma for an officer is to, I, um, to go to a parent, a mother or a father, have to knock, imagine that. Imagine yourself approaching a door that you're gonna knock on the door or ring the doorbell and you have to give the, uh, the news to a mother or a father that their, their child 
is not ever returning home. Right. I've heard that the, the blood curdling like shrieks, like just sears into their soul. It's like always there that, that, that pain that they uh, have been a part of have heard. And at the same time, they have to hold a strong front. Um, so this, the interview that I did was with this gentleman 30 years ago, he um, had to deliver the, the horrible news to a parents about um, a child that was uh, involved in a, a car accident in a passenger seat. He told the mother, the father, and then the five-year-old sister ha wanted to give this officer a teddy bear. The five-year-old sister of the, the boy that was, that was killed said, please give this to my brother wherever he is because he gave this to me. Mm. And this officer that I was interviewing you know, months ago, he broke down. He broke down and he goes, I can't believe I'm crying about this now. It's been 30 years. That gives you an indication how we store things, how we have to like, do our duty at the time. But then only when it's maybe safe and maybe you're in a good company and maybe somebody's really listening to you, then it's safe to, to let it go. And afterwards he went, I can't believe what I just experienced. Like grieving about that experience from 30 years ago, I feel so much better. Yes. So I imagine amplifying that so much better across the nation and the EMDR work. Oh, yeah. and right. I mean, your, your vision about hope and healing. Hello, let's all work towards this. We can yes. help this. Right. And the educational piece of the film, Jim, because when that happens and people say that all the time in counseling, I can't believe I'm thinking about this right now. That was 20, 30, 10 years ago. Um, I, we get the opportunity to explain that the database that we have inside of our supercomputer doesn't have the calendar that says, oh, that was 30 years ago. It just says, ah. I remember that and it pulls up the file as if it was now and as if you relate to however you relate to it now. And yeah. I am sure with that officer, many other death notifications since then. Right. Okay. So it gets, it gets cumulatively piled because our system wants to file things in a similar place that are similar so that when we need it, we get, we, we get the learnings. And as Terry, you know, with the MDR, is you get to keep the learnings and the meaning of the experience. Like many officers in those situations will say, you know, I'm glad it was me, I could hold their hands. Or I'm glad it was me, you know, because I did it this way, even as hard as it was for them. Um, but that they can find meaning and hold it that way without the, what we call it negative emotion, but it's that energy charge that holds us back or the pain, we don't need the pain, we will still have the event and the learning and the memory and the meaning. Yes. So that, that's the beauty and kind of the magic, as you know, of EMDR. Yeah, I call it the uh, finding the gift within the chaos. Right, um, and you know, I, I like to say to officers like that, well, you know what, if you weren't a little tearful about this, that would be weird. Right. You know, you, you, this just shows you that you are still human that you have not shut down your humanity, which many feel like they have to do, their compassionate and their you know, empathy um, just to survive. Right. Uh, but the, the relief that you talked about, Jim, you know, the potential of this film, um, yeah, is amazing. Because it provides the education, it provides the permission, it provides the relatability to the peers, and then a little bit of education of, hey, you're not crazy, you're human. Right. Very good. Jim, I know you, you and I talked a little bit beforehand about, you know, did you want to touch any on your own personal journey at all? Well, yeah, I think it's important to, uh, just to note that we're all on a journey. You know, we're all human and uh, we all have a path. And part of that path is will we, we will be wounded, you know, in our own different ways. It's part of the growth. And I think the growth happens when you return. So, you know, so part of the process is to be wounded, but the strength and the truth of who you really are appears upon your return. Like as you grow, as you come back, it's like your comeback story, right? My own comeback story, you know, it's not as dramatic as, um, you know, these officers, but it was just, you know, 
neglect. I mean, I grew up neglected, ignored. Uh, this is my own personal story. Um, people in my family might not even say that's not even true, but my perception was uh, not important, un unimportant, not to be seen, not to be heard. So what's my comeback story? Oh, I know I'll be a writer and I'll be a producer and I'll make film. I'll be a scene as much as I need to. I'll be on a zoom call where it's videotaped. Hello. I mean, whatever it takes. So, you know, the strength that I gather in coming back, it also might even give me power to face the idea of, you know, not being important enough, not having enough value. Uh, my expression doesn't mean anything. These are all my own PTSD in a way, my own belief system that was built over time as a child. So my comeback was um, I found two different uh, avenues. One was through breath work, uh, using breath work, which is a, like a very deep meditation, but the, mm -hmm. using a certain type of circular deep breath that leads you inward and deeply inside to levels that you would not consciously know, to levels of 30 years ago, which, oh, I didn't even know was there, bringing up files like Dr. Sarah is saying. This breath work takes me so far inside that I would find these files, find these places, and it's the actually looking at, to not discard or put it away, but to actually look at face to face that monster from the dream, right? As, far, as long as you run away from the monster in a dream, it has power. But as soon as you face it and look it right in the eye, you might notice, I am bigger than this, I'm better than that. So my healing path was, you know, using breath work. Uh, I've also belonged to a men's organization where, you know, we, we work together to, to, to strengthen ourselves so that we can actually have the sort of context or presence of strength, but also to have that human side. So it's a little bit very balanced. So, so I think a lot of the healing work that I've done in the past and the work that I have done led me to this so that I can present healing in a way that's not, as one officer said, like, oh, what do we hug it out? It's like, you know, it's like, do we hug it out? It's like, <laughs> no, it's not exactly hugging. <laughs> out um it's hard but the kevlar vest you know you can't get that close <laughs> exactly <laughs> right <laughs> so uh so yeah so my path is just being able to express myself uh and have others express themselves all these interviews that i've done to present it in a way that really i think reaches the heart of the matter because that's what a film can do that's what good editing can do yes. and music is it touches on the a level it reaches it's like any movie if you see a good movie it, it reaches uh you with all the elements that are involved, the editing, the timing, I mean, down to the split second, you know, if, an, right. if a movie's not edited to the split second, the mind just goes, nope, it's like humor. Like <laughs> humor's gotta be right on, or the audience goes, nope, sorry. And so my editing, my abilities lend themselves into the film like this, which I believe, which I know, will bring a lot of healing, a lot of hope, and, um, you know, a lot of peace. Very cool. I know, I don't know if you've ever looked at anything into adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, which I think I had said, you know, like Oprah is starting to talk about it. And, um, and neglect is one of the 10 on the score. You know, there's a score of one to 10 things and, and neglect is one of them. So that is certainly a traumatic experience for a child to, to have to um, live with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those early years. So. And uh, yeah, and I know everyone finds their path that reverses any um, of the potentially they find a path that reverses any negative thought forms. You know, they get the opportunity to overcome it. And in that, like we were talking about earlier, let's bring some people with us. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, no, it's like not enough to have your own healing. I mean, it is enough on a certain yeah. level, but it's exciting. And it's almost like a higher purpose takes over something mm -hmm. bigger than ourselves takes over. And now we want to not force anyone, but open the door. For yeah. anyone who also would be helped by what we have learned. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think we also know there's no separation, you know, between any of us, really. Um, so we're, we're, if I'm experiencing something or been through something, you know, you have a similar something. And so that connectivity, um, because we're all one, you know, but communicating with the first responder and police community where... They're, they are set apart in a way that they've decided at some point, not because of money or prestige um, or fame or to get on Oprah, but because of their sense of purpose to be willing to and accept the fact that they're risking their lives and they're willing to give it up for the greater good. And when 
we get them back to remembering why did they sign up in the first place? Um, you know, Jim, your story, it also is about clearing the path to get to the resilience. We are phenomenally resilient, but a lot of times there's all this stuff, negative thoughts and core beliefs and, and cumulative stress. It sort of, I, I feel like the pileup gets in the way of us getting back to that resilience that's already there. And when you come back in the journey, you're, you're grabbing your resilience and bringing it forward. And we really know now that there's some things we can do currently to what we call, they're called protective factors for people in these high hazardous jobs to protect themselves and to build on their resilience. Resilience isn't a, a gift at birth and that's it. You know, we have to fuel it and build on it and clear the path of all the other stuff. Um, so this, I think the film has the potential for being able to remind people to work on their resilience and, and maintain it throughout the career. And I'd love to see the mortality rate of cops change. Oh, you know, it's, sure. uh, that's the goal. You know, the goal uh, isn't let's reduce the suicide numbers, which of course that's the goal. But how about the quality of life throughout the career? Um, that's really um, what I think this film can help remind everybody of is to build on that. And what's yeah. interesting too, what's interesting is I, um, you might not know this, uh, but Sarah and I, we had a, a connection. There's been many different connections, but like the way the universe works, right? It's kind, right. Of, it's kind of playful. <laughs> it puts people together. And uh, I was working uh, on a success story, a woman who actually, uh, a woman officer uh, who was with San Diego Police Department, she was actually shot in the neck. She was shot mm -hmm. in the neck and she had to have her own comeback story to her, her resiliency and you know, overcoming that. Uh, and her name's Heather Seddon, and she'll be highlighted in the film as a success story of somebody who went through incredible trauma. Now she's a detective, you know, and she actually does speaking engagements where she canine. speaks about hers. Yeah. <laughs> and then canine too. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. And then, the, and then what's interesting is like, oh, Sarah. So I meet Dr. Sarah, and she's like, oh, Heather. Yeah, she's a very close friend of mine, or something <laughs> like that. Is is that true? Yeah, my son and Heather and. And her husband, I mean, I've known them. My son is 30 and a Navy doctor, sports med. But Heather and her husband, Brian, and my son and his wife, I, I mean, they're like my kids. <laughs> and so Jim's telling me this story. I mean, they've been at my home and, you know, I've you know, watched them grow up. And, and uh, obviously, as you said on that other uh, situation in your town, when something happens in this rippling effect, yeah. when, Heather, when Heather was shot, Oh my I mean, gosh. I, I, I just, when I said those words, when Heather was shot, I just got like goosebumps and shook for a moment. That's what it was like uh, on steroids because the rippling effect, because, you know, in towns, everyone knows everyone or is connected to somebody somehow. So right. Jim is inadvertently telling me this story and I went, oh, Heather? <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was, the rippling effect was awful. And then watching, uh, you know, their relationship and their friends and their families. And uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, and she lives to tell about it, which is remarkable. Yeah. You know, the other piece that I want to commend, um, well, the officers and Jim. So whatever happened, Jim got in and departments, because, you know, they're, they have regulations and media and all this stuff, but I, I don't know what happened because there's multiple departments represented in this film. But at some point, everybody said, okay, let's go. And they, they approved it, you know, because police officers can't just speak on any, you know, active right. duty. Um, and so I, way to go, Jim. You're right, <laughs> right. That, that does not happen very often. I mean, you know, with that many departments and that many people. And uh, <laughs> so I feel like they heard him um, but remember, they're the biggest skeptics in the world because they have to be. Um, but I, my sense is they felt him as well. And right. uh, you got indoors that uh, kept evolving. Yeah, I like to say that, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't go away. So I think there's like yeah, this, there's this, period, there's this period of, uh, wait a minute, 
I mean, they, they have enough experience of like maybe what's a, a hoax or what's like not legit. And so for somebody to not go away for that long, okay, let's check them out. Maybe they even ran my numbers. Who knows? Who cares? But uh, it's <laughs> oh, all good. Oh, Jim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't go away. And then also uh, I said later to someone, oh, yeah, the police foundation, the, there's the San Diego Police Foundation, they've sponsored a little bit of uh, support for the film. And I told the, uh, uh, the president there, uh, her name's Sarah as well. I said, wow, there's nothing like having the trust of police chiefs. Like there's just, it's a real re reflection for me. It's like a gift. Like they really, they trust me. They know I'm, you know, on the level and that I do want the best. Right. You know? So that's right. a, to get that kind of reflection, that's healing uh, on some level for myself. You right. know, it's really awesome. I'm writing a piece for my newsletter. I'm writing a series and it's called The Power of Persistence. I may just put you in it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, I'm curious about something. How did you come up with the title, Peace for the Peacemakers? Well, well actually, I was working on the, uh, like we have a GoFundMe page, um, uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Sarah, and I was sitting with a friend of mine and we're like working through the content. Like, what do we say? The thing, it wasn't even named. The title wasn't even named yet. We had a certain phrase, like you're saying, you know, peace for the uh, peacekeepers. And at some point, I think I just said it out loud. I said, well, you know, keeping the peace. And we both looked at each other like, <gasps> keeping the peace. That says it, you know, keeping the peace for, um, that's their job to keep the peace. But if you look at another level, it's keeping the, the peace for the officers. Sure, well. like their internal peace yeah. Keeping it, yeah and keeping the peace now that i said it out loud again we talked about resiliency um and like the idea of prevention you know there's another word yeah. you use besides that um but it has the idea of like oh i guess you use the word inoculate that's the first time i heard that phrase yes like to be able to proactively be working on the self as a way of guarding against what could come down the road that let's, build up right keep, yeah let's keep the peace as we move forward yeah Beautiful. So I have to ask you both only because you were talking about making these little snippets. I make, I make little snippets like little shorter videos of this particular question and answer because I just love it. It's like that one question that all the guests are just like, Oh, that's so amazing. Like, so, and you can answer, you can both answer or just one of you, but if you could meet anyone dead or alive to help you with this project, with your journey, with whatever it is, who would it be? Hmm. See, it's one of those, oh. Well, I'll, I'll just say what popped up. And of course, I'm going to spend the rest of the day asking myself, why did that pop up? <laughs> uh, uh, Nelson Mandela came up. I don't know. Peace. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I got when you said his name. So, yeah. yeah. My, what I got was two gentlemen, their brothers, uh, John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, uh, I felt that they were uh, so passionate about um, like really wanting the best for not just, you know, locally, but, you know, globally. So uh, they had the spirit of, um, yeah, the spirit of total uh, giving. So that's my answer. All right. Wait, I want to know, Terry, what about you? <laughs> I, I say Mother Teresa. <laughs> Yeah, that's in there. Yeah, because, um, you know, These she was that bit fire. Yeah, get into the trenches and that same sort of thing that we've been talking about of kind of holding her hand out and, you know, helping, helping those who are struggling to, to get out of the trenches. And, um, you know, the, the, the work you're both doing is certainly that, that same sort of thing. And I think those of us who have been through this and then go back down in to be like, come on. You can do yeah. this, you know. Come on, you can do it. So, and she yeah. did that. She held people accountable to get get in there up to their elbows. I love yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. So, any other things that you want to touch on, either one of you, before we close out? Well, I did want to give uh, your audience a vision because I think the more minds that are on this and are picture this, imagine this, will be as helpful. I mean, logically and also like an ethereal level. So the vision is this, May of 2019, it's coming up very fast. It is a, a week that they designate as National Police Week, May of 2019. And that is the week 
or the vision is that um, we have care packages that are created uh, across the country. In this package is the educational film, the 30 minute film, as well as some of the vignettes that they can use if they need to, uh, as well as, you know, different things like, you know, uh, maybe a study guide that they can use if, uh, in watching this. And they being the different departments across the country, the different police departments. So it'll be a special day dedicated to this um, activity where all these different contacts that I've made are able to deliver this care package and hopefully we'll get media in each of these locations like a care package for the police departments, you know, for their own wellness. Like this is different. So uh, that'll be happening across the country and in San Diego where Dr. Sarah and I are, we'll, uh, I'm planning a special event where we can show the film as a premiere uh, and also have a panel of experts speak, uh, different chiefs, uh, maybe Dr. Sarah, if she's available, that'd be awesome. And they could speak on the matter and have a real, you know, upbeat event around this vision that we have. So that's coming up in May. Um, I'm uh, fundraising now to make sure that all the different pieces get, uh, you know, get paid for. So uh, can I mention my uh, website? Sure. And I was just uh, going to say, what is your website so people can get on and, and find oh, out all about it? Yes. Awesome. So, but the website you would go to to, to see the details. Uh, I actually have a running calendar of all the details of, uh, of all the updates. Um, you could find the details there as well as the, the funding page. There's a link on there. And it's legacyproductions.org. So it's okay. plural, legacyproductions. And I'll put it here. I'll edit it in on so people can have the visual that are looking at the video. But yes. That's awesome. And then you go to that page and you just – you know, a little bit like maybe halfway down, you'll see a, an image of uh, police officers and the logo for this uh, project. You just click on there and then you get right to that site. Wonderful. And All I right. want to mention too, I want to mention too that um, one of the videos, one of the promotional videos that I made is called I Have Seen. So it's a montage of these different chiefs and officers talking about the different things that they've seen over the years. And there's, you know, nice, there's music underneath it. And it's very, uh, I think it's heart touching and it's also mind opening. And what's interesting, Dr. Sarah, maybe you tell the story, but there's a link there too for something Dr. Sarah wrote that was kind of related, but it was related to that, that episode. Oh yeah. One night Jim sent me the link and said, Hey, check out the montage. And I, I was, done and i've been doing this for 30 years i've heard uh, everything from these officers and it really struck a chord in me of what i have seen as a first responder myself as a mental health critical incident uh, professional who's gone in to do death notifications in support of the police but you know being there and then the therapist in the office of working with first responders so i was just at my computer and i said well i have seen and i wrote this thing and i just shared it with jim and i at the end i you know certainly was crying and it's like we're all in this together i yeah. too have seen and um Maybe, maybe that's what drives me as part of this project. And I do want to say that I don't, I, I'm not um, taking, there's no uh, financial gain for me in this. Um, and when I want people to think about donating any amount, when you do that, you can look up at the next police officer you see and say to yourself and perhaps say to them, hey, I just contributed to your wellness. <laughs> Um, because this is going to ripple out. So, you yeah. know, so many people ask me, well, what can I do um, for the first responders that have helped me? And you can get involved at any level. Every, every dollar, you know, is helping this get out. Um, and so donate and do the feel good, you know, whatever amount you have, and then let your law enforcement, you know, even if you get pulled over, you could say, hey, you know, I just contributed to your wellness. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So is that is the video on the website? Yes. Uh, the okay. I have seen the I have seen is an eight minute short pro, uh, promo video. It's on the website. Yeah. Wonderful. Is it on YouTube or Vimeo or anything too? Yeah, it's unlisted on uh, YouTube at the moment. I can unlist it and uh, I can send you a link as well. Yeah. Well, I can. I mean, I'll certainly share the website. But if it was YouTube, I, I was going to share it also on the. Um, on my Facebook page and my social media. So definitely, yeah, definitely, 
Yeah, definitely on YouTube. I'll send you the link. Okay, cool. Wonderful. All right. Well, it has been an absolute honor having both of you on. Um, thank you so much again for the work you do and for, for sharing this with, with the Healing Place podcast audience. Yeah, I appreciate the time and I, pre and I love being on your team of hope and healing. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to Into the Healing Place podcast. And until next time, remember to be gentle with yourselves. Thanks. Bye-bye.